Hello, lovelies, and welcome to episode number three, if I have not miscounted, of Making Stories Knit Swift. I'm Hannah Lisa, your host for today and always, and I'm joined today by my friend and wonderful yarn dyer and all around awesome person, Emma Robinson of Woolly Mammoth Fabrico. Hi, Emma, and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so, so glad we get to do this because, I mean, you know how much I admire your work, uh, both personally and also professionally. And I'm just so glad that we can share one of our chats with the community. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly, um, I'll just quickly double check that everything is in order here. Um, with a live stream and that is working properly. Um, and while YouTube is loading, um, ah. <gasps> Are you there? Okay. Okay. I think we're back. Or at least I'm oh. back. <laughs> I think what's just happening is I can't access the YouTube live stream uh, control room, which is slightly awkward because it means um, I'm not able to see any questions. Um, so let me just give me a second um, and pull up our YouTube live on my phone. So this is um, this is always the backup plan. Have a second device or a tech issues. Yay. Okay, <laughs> great. So we are live. I can see us on here. Which oh, is really? great. Yeah, I can. <laughs> and 16 people are watching right now. Hi, 16 people. Oh, hi. Um, yeah. So um, before we um, uh, before we lose connection again, which I hope won't happen, we're going to continue with our lovely live chat. I will do one thing before that. Um, I'm assuming, Claire, that you're watching. So if there are any viewer questions, if you could send them to me via WhatsApp, this is the backup plan number C, which Claire didn't know about until now. So improvising. <laughs> Welcome to the world of making stories. Highly professional on the outside. Inside, sometimes not so much. But we'll make it work. Um, so Claire, if there are any viewer questions, if you could send them to me on WhatsApp, I'll keep your WhatsApp open um, and um, hopefully that'll do the trick. Okay, back to you, Emma. I'm so sorry about the tech troubles because oh, today is actually all about you, not about us and not about tech issues. <laughs> Why don't... <laughs> um, so um, for anyone who does not know you, which I'm assuming are not a lot of people, would you mind just introducing yourself to our viewers and talk a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm Emma and I, um, I naturally dye a yarn, um, in particular like breed specific kind of yarn um, from kind of interest in sheep breeds 
Um, and I'm from Northern Ireland and that's where I live. And uh, yeah. I think that's <laughs> more... Sorry, say again. Do you want more information than that or? <laughs> No, I think that very accurately sums up what you do. Um, it did not tell people that you create, I think, um, probably the loveliest colors that I've seen from indie dyers in a long, long time. Um, oh. <laughs> which, yeah, um, so beautiful. Let me just show you a sneak peek of like <laughs> the thing that I'm currently knitting, uh, which is Emma's natural sock yarn. Um, and um it so i think this this is what actually launched you on the radar of a lot of designers as well just your ability to naturally dye yarn in a range of really beautiful colors um but i think you've come quite a long way since you first started out dyeing at least that's from my perspective you've gone on quite a journey to come to where you are today which is really about all the breed specific yarns um mm. how about you tell us a little bit about how that journey has been for you where did you start and how did you arrive at where you are today with woolly mammoth, mammoth fiber co well when i started i was um i was really only sort of ex i was doing like a lot of experimenting so it's a big jump to go from kind of experimenting on a small scale to like dyeing, you know, several hundred skeins for an update. So that was kind of interesting, but I just kind of um, got used to a process that I kind of came up with. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose it was gradual, so it wasn't like a big jump. So I went from having like two pots, one mordant pot and one dye pot to maybe having like four to maybe having like, well, I only have six now. So, <laughs> um, so it was kind of like, uh, gradual. So yeah. Yeah. And I suppose obviously when you're starting, um, you're kind of, you're just playing in yeah you're just playing with it and then gradually you start to become more like okay well i want to make this certain color and you go through a whole process of like trying to get that color and mm. it, if anyone knows using natural dyes are kind of sometimes a little bit unpredictable sometimes uh difficult sometimes yeah sometimes things just don't work the way you think they're going to work and if you make it work once you can't necessarily make it work again mm. which is not a good business model basically so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it took me a while to kind of learn what things were easier to make again and then those were my colors and then i have my kind of more playful colors where I just experiment with stuff and those are like one of a kinds. Um, yeah, so was there another part to that question that I uh, just missed? No, I think this, I think that describes beautifully sort of how everything went from just experimenting with dyeing and to scaling up a business, which I think is something that at least in the indie yarn dyeing world, um, a few people have done, but I think a lot of people um, really start out with this experimentation phase and then get stuck at their passion for creating beautiful colors and that not, not you know, really playing mm -hmm. to the business side of things, which means you have to have repeatable colorways, you know, you have to be able to produce a certain amount, you have to be able to manage your stock so that when a pattern comes out in your yarn you yeah. have that yarn available um and exactly. i think <laughs> yeah um this is it's just fascinating to me did you just like did you all work this out on the go just trying different processes figuring things out or how did that work 
Yeah, well, to be honest with you, I didn't really sit down and think, oh, I need to do this, I need to do this. Like, it would be more like I had a problem and I had to solve it. So let me think of an example. Uh, uh, just recently, uh, well, maybe like six months ago now, like, I was just finding the twisting up of the skeins too much to do by hand. So I got a skein twister to help me do that. And it was just because I was literally getting tired just doing it. And I was like, well, this will help me a little bit. So mm -hmm. why would I not get it? <laughs> so yeah. the process has evolved out of problems, I suppose. And how I kind of figured out how I could solve the problems. I love that. And I think it also leads to unexpected, I don't know, collaborations and results. And that's maybe a nice segue into talking more about that um, shift that you also did towards sourcing your own yarns, because now you're working, I think, mostly with yarn that has been custom spun for you. Um, and yeah. that you source yourself, and that um, often is breed specific, always is non superwash. And I think for the most part, it's spun in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, you're a better advertisement than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> yeah. I and mean... so, so um, what actually made you? want to get your own custom like your first custom I think this is actually this was your first custom yarn right like not this particular yeah. skein obviously but this is natural sock and if I remember correctly this was the first one that you had spun up specifically for you right yes that's right um so basically whenever so I got that spun in it was within my I think it was within the first year of business actually um and I just didn't see a lot of uh, stock yarns without nylon yeah. um, that were non superwash and I thought well why don't I get one made and I don't even I don't say that lightly because it costs a lot of money and I was kind of I was a bit scared like to be honest with you <laughs> yeah I um, can imagine it like I mean, I just, you, you have to probably pay for everything up front and yeah, then and recoup the cost yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly so I was kind of like, oh, should I do this or should I not? And then I was like, you know what? If I don't just try it and see what happens, like I might regret it later. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that and that was that was quite a big spin, you know, in your first year of business. So that was something like 80 kilograms of wool, which is like 800 Ooh. skeins. And that's the minimum from the, that particular mill that I um was working with so uh yeah it's quite a lot um but thankfully that particular risk paid off <laughs> yeah so it sold well then like... mm -hmm. yeah people were really interested in it and I, I i i had this tutor that told me in college like when I was studying photography, he said, um, if you're interested in what, what you're doing, then other people probably will be as well. And I just thought, well, that's quite a good piece of advice. Um, so I suppose I was kind of, it was something I was looking for and something I was interested in. And I just thought, yeah, I'm sure hopefully other people will be into it as yeah. well. And I remember at that time I was, so incredibly excited for that yarn because there just weren't a lot of non superwash sock yarns out there. Um, and I think that must have been around the time when we were producing socks. So like a couple of years ago, we did um, a digital collection with only sock patterns using all natural non superwash yarns. And it was incredibly difficult to source seven different yarns. Like it mm. is broke my brain mm -hmm. nearly um and this is why i was so excited and to this day it's one of my there are more non-superwash all natural sock yarns now um mm -hmm. than there were back then but this yeah like you did an incredibly good job at getting this spun up 
to be a really good sock yarn. It's one of my favorite ones. No, because it's like, I don't say this lightly. I have, well, particular taste in yarn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, no, but it's like, because it's, I think it's, it has a super nice feel to it. It has just enough twists for it to show up, to show up stitch patterns beautifully. Like this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously takes dye beautifully um, and it holds up really well. Uh, so that's really, and I have a pair of socks in your yarn that I've been wearing and they've been wearing. Like it's super well. Um, good, yeah. And I think and another thing on on the sock yarn, if I can just add one thing. Um, so when I was getting that spun, it wasn't just important that it was without nylon and non-zipper wash. It was also important that I knew what country the fiber came from, and also um, I wanted it to be spun in the UK. Um, so that was also another um, consideration that made finding, you know, a base like that uh, more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you can probably find uh, uh, like sock yarns without nylon that are non super wash, but maybe they're spun in Spain or maybe they're spun in wherever, Italy. Um, but I want it because all the fiber in the natural sock is from the UK as well. And I wanted that to be part of the part of the process, I suppose. I love that. So now you have the natural socks, so this is the fingering weight. You also have the same blend in a DK weight, right? Yeah. Um, and over the course of the last year, years, I would say, you've added more breed specific, limited edition yarns to your repertoire. And um, talk to us about that part of your business? Where do you source those fleeces from? Where are they spun up? And how did you get to do that in addition to sort of the large batch spin for the natural sock? So how did it start? Um, I suppose I had some people coming to me saying, I have fleeces, are you interested in them? That sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, I was kind of spotting sheep in fields around mm -hmm. the country. <laughs> and um, you always hear stories of like farmers not um, being able to sell the fleeces or it would, you know, they sort of think it's not really worth their time being bothered. And I just thought that's a horrible sort of disconnect and something needs to be done about it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, again, Emma takes it upon herself to do something about these problems. Um, so yeah, so I can tell you a funny story about the Jacobs actually, which is the of what I'm wearing at the moment. Um, I was driving with a friend um, to my dad's house and en route I seen the sheep in uh, near my dad's cousin's house and they were just he has an organ an organic farm and they were just grazing outside and Jacob's sheep are really distinctive like they're not around here we would have a lot of black faced sheep like you'd see them everywhere Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Jacobs are so, because they've got like big horns and they're dark coloured and um, that's not the sort of thing you see around here anyway. So I went into, there's a cafe on, on the organic farm and uh, I went in and uh, sort of said, um, who, who do those sheep belong to? And uh, of course being Northern Ireland, like somebody knows, somebody that has the number that you should ring to, you know. So anyway, uh, there's someone in the cafe who, and it was her brother, it was her brother's sheep. So I got the brother's number of the woman in the cafe and rang him up. Um, and lo and behold, when I was talking to my granny, it turns out that she knows who he is and we're, yeah, we're, I, uh, I'll not say any more about that. So anyway, I rang this man up uh, and was like, 
oh, here, see your Jacob's fleeces. Like, what do you do with them? And he's like, oh, I just sell them to this boy here. He just comes and gets them off me sometimes. But, you know, uh, if you thought you would do something with them, uh, sure, you know, I'd sell them to you instead. <laughs> so um, he probably thought he could get a pound or two more. So that, that stood at me fine. Um, because they're going to be more precious to me than they are to some random guy that's taking them to the wool board, probably. Yeah. Um, so I think he had maybe 15 sheep or thereabouts. And uh, uh, me and my dad went over. This was last spring, maybe. And, uh, and we collected them off him and we had a nice chat and everything. And we bunged them into the back of the cattle trailer and took them up uh, to my granny's shed. And uh, yeah, then the process of picking out the poo begins before you can send them off to the mill. So that's very nice. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <Doing a> job. <laughs> so that's that's how yeah uh, how that's how you find you know you just you can just knock on somebody's door or ask somebody if they know somebody or there's a friend of a friend that has sheep or somebody down the road that breeds pedigree sheep that knows, you know, it's all kind of, you just have to keep your eyes peeled. So that's kind of how I got into that. Um, and I don't like the idea of like fleeces or anything like that being waste, especially if they could be used for um, knitting with because, well, what's the point? <laughs> totally. And I just, I love that story so much. <laughs> so stuff. <laughs> Walking into a cafe, meeting the woman whose brother those sheep belong to. It's just it's it's awesome. Um so when you've done the poo picking, you know, like you've sorted the fleeces mm -hmm. and everything, um mm -hmm. they go to a mill or one of the mills that you work with that are all based in the UK, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and then how long, like, how does the process work? You just tell them like, hey, I have these Jacob fleeces. I would like, a, I don't know, fingering to sport weight or DK weight or something. Do your magic? Do you give them more specifications? Do they send like trial schemes? I can't imagine that they do that, but I have no idea. So, um so how it works is uh, I'd probably send several batches at once and they'd arrive at the mill. I'd ring them to say that I'm sending stuff and um, if that's okay. So there's one particular mill that I work with is very, very good. And um, I've tried a few, but I think the guy on wheels, he's, he's definitely the best. Um, and I would just say, look, I'd like a four ply. That's basically all I tell. Yeah, <laughs> because like whatever way his machines work, you know, he gets different meterage depending on whatever way it works out for him. So it could, if mm. I say four ply, it could be anything from like three hundred and fifty meters to four hundred per hundred gram skein. But I don't want to put too too much pressure on him to make it like exactly because I just think, well, it doesn't always work out like that. Whatever way it's spun, you know, in the machines, yeah. Like, um that is just the way it works out sometimes so but it's really good and you'd be usually talking about six months really before you would get something back depends where you send it it can be more like a year yeah so yeah. it's a long game <laughs> yeah and you have to plan ahead which sort of circles back to what we were talking about earlier you know that um i think a lot of the business side of things is really planning ahead and then you know, being okay with that things don't happen overnight. Um, before we dive into that awesome sweater that you're wearing, let's tackle one more question, um, which is related to your take on sustainability. So anyone who's watching has a copy of Attention Product Placement, this beauty here. <laughs> so, 
this is our issue three, um, which has an interview um, with a few different folks from the fiber community on sustainability and business. And Emma is one of them. Um, so how this worked is um, we sent over a bunch of questions to different people who then answered them. And I loved reading Emma's answers the minute that they came into my inbox because I think um, they are super thoughtful and also touch upon a few different um, aspects of sustainability that I think we're not talking about often enough. Um, so what I thought um, was that I would just read out a little bit of your words, if that is okay, and then we can chat a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so here's what you said. Um, in, as an answer to the question, what does running a sustainable business uh, mean it look like for you in an ideal world. In an ideal world, for me, it means to be able to locate and know the source of everything you use and choosing to use things that have been created as close to where you live as possible. Of course, we don't live in an ideal world and these options aren't always possible. I also kind of reject the term sustainable. I genuinely don't think any business or person in this day and age actually can be 100% sustainable in an ecological sense. Just by being alive, we are being unsustainable. However, skepticism aside, I think it is good to push the boundaries on where you source your products to try to make informed decisions about how you can lessen your impact on the world. As a general rule, I would hazard to guess that the smaller the business is, small in the sense of output of goods made, the more sustainable it probably is ecologically. So this is just a small part of what you what you shared. There's more awesomeness where that came from. <laughs> um, Let's talk about this take um, on sustainability. Um, how, if you're looking at it now, and also maybe think back on um, on the time when you answered those questions, how do you think about sustainability in your business at this point in time? That's a big question. Um, I think, oh, where do you even start? Well, it's one thing being sustainable in your business, but you also have to be sustainable in your life, so to speak. So it's not like uh, different for your business than it is for your personal life. Um, but like I said there, the term sustainable, I don't really like using it because I kind of feel like, well, it's kind of a bit of a buzzword and I also feel like it's not... Uh, yeah, I said there I thought it was not possible. I still kind of agree with that. Um, yes. But, yeah, then you can make better choices or worse choices, depending on... Mm. So for me, it's as simple as, okay, not being lazy and actually washing out your recycling before you put it in the bin. Like, that's literally what it comes down to sometimes. And if you yeah. can be bothered to, to do that, first of all, then... Um, of course then it, it, it's, it's sort of silly things I suppose but it's just like having a mindset that's not wasteful I think in general I don't think that's silly at all I think it touches upon a very important thing when it comes to sustainability and that is that I think often we think about the big things you know we think about the fast fashion companies in this world we think about clothing production yarn production in far away places and labor conditions there we think about super wash processes at least that's what i'm thinking about <laughs> um but the reality is that i think sustainability happens in very very small everyday action um, no matter whether that's that is washing out your recycling you know or then maybe if you reorder packaging supplies for your business like investigating a little bit if there's something made out of recycled paper or recycled mm -hmm. plastic and things like that and mm -hmm. really just small things mm -hmm. <laughs> something as 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 small as like turning off the, the like tap like the water faucet when you brush your teeth and yeah exactly 
Yeah. I don't think it's silly at all. I think it's those like mini actions that really make a difference because they will add up. Um, and as much as we might feel that they don't really do that much, if enough people do, like take those actions, I think it will make a difference. It's the same mm -hmm. as with buying things, you know, like every every euro or pound or dollar that is spent on smaller, more sustainable, we're like smaller, more, let's say, mindful businesses rather than with big chains, chains I think makes a difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me ask you if that is okay about what you said. Um, and I know that like we've been talking about this question of how the size of a business contributes to its footprint on the world. Um, mm. And I know that just judging from your success, you have the potential of expanding and growing and that you made a conscious choice um, not to do so. Um, and I loved the conversations that we had about how can your business fit into your life, which I think is also a part of the sustainability interview like that comes later on in, in the interview. Um, and I was wondering, I know this is not on the question list because it just came into my mind. No, but I was wondering if you if you feel comfortable sharing about how you think about this because you're one of the most mindful people that, that I know. Like you, I, I perceive you think very consciously about how your business fits into what you what you want from from your life. Yeah, yeah, I think. That's a big question, isn't it, as well? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, because I am just one person and because my business is producing things, there's only so much one person can produce. So there's like a natural um, kind of cap on what my business should be like. And if I produce any more than that, I end up tired I end up resenting work I end up kind of getting into a bit of a a rut I suppose so it's not good for me it's not good for anybody else to overproduce so um I suppose yeah I don't want to sick of myself of it like I I, st I want to enjoy it and I don't want to rush the process because there's a whole it's not even just the dye and there's a whole lot of administration and financial things and packaging and posting and talking with the accountant and doing this and doing that and ordering supplies so there's like a whole gamut of things that you have to do that aren't just dye and wool and you have to actually make sure you leave enough time to do them as well as the dyeing part so i want to keep the dyeing part not like a massive production but as something that I can enjoy and something that's fun and playful and it doesn't feel like a burden um as well as that like I usually take every weekend off I feel very firmly that um you should definitely have at least one day off one full day off a week that's you don't do anything that feels like work um yeah. And I've done that, so I, I, that's why I don't go on Instagram at the weekend, ever, really. Um, since I got Instagram, that's, that's why I said how I'm going to manage um, that. So, um, so, yeah, like I don't do any work at all at the weekends. Sometimes I just turn my phone off and that's it. You'll, you'll last hear from me on a Thursday night and I'll be back on a Monday morning. <laughs> I, I but I love that. Like I think, like it really, like to me, it's very inspiring. It's I think there was one week where I where I actually sent you like a WhatsApp on Friday, and it didn't get read read until Monday morning. And I was like, Emma switched her phone off. I think I should switch my phone off. Hmm. I think I should really switch my phone off. <laughs> um, and it's really I I so admire that because it's so like even in this community of ours that I think has become a lot more mindful when it comes to social media consumption, you know, and what, which role that plays in our lives. 
um, there was a lot of pressure to be online all the time and to work all the time. And so having someone, this is very selfish of me, but having someone in my life, you, who tells me to switch off and that it's okay that a business should be enjoyable, you know, and that that doesn't have to mean that you have to work 24 seven and that that is also counterproductive um, is very, I enjoy that very much. <laughs> All right, should we switch from the big questions to more manageable ones? <laughs> <laughs> let's talk okay first of all let's talk about that beautiful sweater of yours that you're wearing and then talk about works in progress oh before we do that though i got a note from claire that we have a question so maybe we can talk about that first oh. it's an easy one as well uh okay, so barbara <laughs> hi barbara and um, barbara is asking if your yarn is woolen or worsted spun so both. So some bases are worsted spun, um, but all the limited edition bases are woolen spun. So yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's actually a massive difference between my yarns. Like if you buy one and another, they'll probably not go great together. So uh, yeah, I would buy one or the other probably. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're wondering about the difference, like the woolen spun is way more airy and lofty and sort of grippy and the worst it spun is more um of a sleek spin so it's like the natural stock is worse that spun um so that makes it really more i think it probably makes it more hardware and i'm not sure um but yeah and a few other most of my other bases are worse that spun yeah apart from the limited edition ones they're all wool and spun so yeah, I hope that answers that question. It does. Can I follow this up with another question that I just came in that just came in? Because yeah. it kind of goes into the same direction. So this one's from Claire and Claire um, asks if you could talk a little bit about how the different um, fiber breeds affect the colors of the natural dyes like does the difference in crimp make a difference and obviously the difference in base color? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Very juicy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so obviously the jet is like, I didn't dye that, but if I dyed the same color on this as I did on a white base, it would look completely different. So like, it would just be, you know, so if you dye on a white base and you dye the same color in a gray base, it'll be completely different looking. Yeah. So, and then also the tone of the natural color of the yarn can affect how the color comes out as well. So some bases you get that are really like white, white, they will be really different to other bases you get, like the Dorsa Alpaca one, the new one, it's quite creamy. The Alpaca makes it quite creamy. Um, so obviously when I'm dying in that, the colors will turn out a bit differently as well. Um, and the crimp as well, yeah, so you get, quite a lot of breeds you know like Wensley Dale, like Tees Water, those sorts of breeds, really really long wool breeds, um, they have an amazing luster when they're spun, really really beautiful and that also the drape is different on that as well um, but that doesn't so much affect the colours of the dyeing but you will notice like it has like a sheen on it on my Wensley Dale. Um, but again if for example, one of my yarns, the Causeway yarn, um, my first limited edition yarn had tea's water in it, but it was wool and spun. So you couldn't really see the luster as much, but mm. um, it gave it a, a lovely kind of softness. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. I think it does, and it did so beautifully. Um, all right, now let's talk about that sweater because it looks <laughs> awesome. Okay, so what pattern is it? And you said it's knit in your Jacob yarn, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it is the Scale Grass Wear by a designer who lives in Donegal, um, just over uh, kind of, it's the north, slightly northwest of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, 
a scale gram means love story, I think. And it, uh, I first seen the pattern at um, Woolen Festival of Yarn in Dublin. Um, and I thought, oh, that's lovely. Someday I'm going to knit that. And then I got my Jacobs and I thought, oh, this would be a good combo. Um, because the Jacobs yarn has like a nice amount of structure, but it's also like sort of fairly soft. So it, and it's quite airy, and the way it's spun is 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 nice and lofty. And I just thought the rustic yarn with the combination of the lace yoke would be really nice. And um, yeah, I'm really pleased with the result. I made quite a few modifications on it, um, so that was kind of fun as well. Ooh, yeah, I love that. I love that so, so much. Like that combination of especially the woolen spun with the lace um, yeah. in a yoke makes me want to pass something something on. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you have currently on your needles? You want to show us? Yeah, this is exciting. Okay, I can um, tell you the story about the, <laughs> the salt gauge. Yes! <laughs> the salt gauge story that <laughs> seems to go on and on and on. So, um, I then, Albina, the, the girl that um, designed this sweater, I sent her a message asking about salt gauge and what, what her, she's very savvy when it comes to things like that. So I thought, oh, well, Albina will know the answer. So she said that the best gauge for socks was 35 stitches per 10 centimeters. So I was like, right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure I've got the perfect gauge for socks. And um, uh, I got some 1.5 millimeter needles, needles and 1.75 millimeter needles because I'm a very loose knitter. So I didn't, I don't think I realized what my gauge was on my socks exactly. Cause I was using two millimeter needles and I was like, oh, like it seems fine. But sh she would sort of say that, you know, even one stitch too many can make a, a big difference mm. in terms of having hardware and socks. And she would be very, um, uh, I don't know, she's very knowledgeable about that sort of thing. So um, I decided to do a few tests. Um, so the first one I cast on was on the 1.5 millimeter needles. Um, so this is it here. And I was like, yeah, this looks about the right size. Um, so I started knitting it anyway. It was only supposed to be a swatch. And I was like, oh, sure, I might as well just make it into a sock and that'll be like one big swatch. <laughs> um, so this is how far I got. And then I tried it on and was like, yeah, this is definitely too small. It doesn't fit my foot, mm. but the gauge, the gauge is quite good. So it was coming in something uh, like 35 stitches per eight and a half centimeters or something like that. And the fabric is really dense and lovely. And I can see that that would make a lovely sock. So, but I would have to cast on more stitches if I wanted to continue. Yeah. So I cast it on 64. So, but I'd have to cast on more than that obviously to make it fit my foot so that was the stage one of the sock saga stage two was casting on another one um on the 1.75 millimeter needles and the gauge for this was coming in at about uh 9.25 or nine and a half centimeters for 35 stitches so this is near enough what she was saying and it looks like it's going to fit better than that's the size difference. Ooh, yeah. So I'm thinking I could be on to a winner with this one. So I'm going to finish to the end of this sock and see if it fits. And I think I will, yeah, definitely do this more <laughs> in the future. And uh, it's amazing how quick the 1.75 goes compared to the 1.5 actually. Like the 1.5 was a slog, but the 1.75 was pretty fast actually. So, or maybe it just seemed fast compared to 1.5. So <laughs> that is the sock saga. Um, I do have something else on the needles. I don't know if you want to see something else. Yes, please. Um, so this is a shawl 
that I am designing or trying to design. <laughs> this was my little, um, uh, how can you say, Te like it was a test to see if I could do it because I am not extremely mathematical. <laughs> And it was a test just to see if I could do it, really. So I knit it one version of this actually at EYF last year in used wool. And so I made it, it looked quite good, but like there was definitely things that I thought I should change. So mm -hmm. this is my second time knitting this. So I'll just show it to you. I don't know if you can see. So it's basically, what would this be called? Like a traditional shawl shape, like a, a triangular shawl shape. Was that yeah, a triangular shawl. Yeah. And then, so it's doing that. This is in my BFL Gotland four ply base. And then um, this is undyed the gray. And then this color is peony. Um, mm. And this is the lace section. So it's, yeah so basically I did major surgery on this at the weekend it required my full, full attention because I had it out on a blocking board and everything pinned out to try and fix my mistake so I fixed my mistake so now I'm at the point where I have to think of what I'm going to put in the side panels uh, because I don't have enough stitches to do a full repeat yeah so that's my next mission what I'm going to do next and after I finish this I'm going to do more garter um and then a nice cast off I think um, and I was uh, I haven't released the name of it yet but I have chosen the name um and I'll, I'll give a hint about it if you're interested yes please so I know we were talking before, but I've just really discovered um, the Anglo-Saxons and Dean Law and all this period in history. And I've come across one um, particular person from that period that has kind of captured my attention. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, everyone who is watching, um and who has an idea who that might be, just comment down below. I'm very Whoa. curious. I have no idea. Um, so, I, it looks it looks beautiful. Do you have like a release date in mind or are you just taking your time with getting the design and the sample done and then writing up the pattern? Well, I decided when I started doing this that I didn't want it to feel like work so that I could work on it, you know, at the weekends yeah. and stuff. So basically there's no release date, but if I could figure out my problems with this one um, and then write it all down, I mean, I'm sure it will be this year sometime, maybe. Yeah, yeah. okay. Everyone keep an eye on Emma's Instagram and also her lovely podcast where she might announce that release of the beautiful shawl. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. I'm not even a shawl there and I want to knit that one. Um, <laughs> Okay, lovelies, before we wrap up, um, are there any more questions for Emma? If so, now is the time to ask. Um, just comment down below and Claire will forward them to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, while we wait for maybe like two, three more minutes to see if there are any more questions. Um, I love that you're designing now. You have very good eyes. Well, so. I'm, I'm not designing. I am I'm, I'm something. <laughs> I don't know if you could call it designer just yet. <laughs> that is okay. That is like everyone starts somewhere. And I was working before we got on this call, I was working on my designs for our kids collection that comes at some point later this year. And I was like, Ooh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, I'm not a designer either. I'm a publisher. This is what I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and yeah. that'll be so nice. But I think I think it's like I I really like that type of work, as you said, because it like I mean it it is mathematical. It requires a different part of your brain, and I find that especially with this now, I enjoy that I'm able to take my time with those designs. It's still like for me, it's still work, but 
I'm a lot more confident because there's not that much time pressure behind it. I know I can take my time and I know that it's okay, you know, if things don't go as planned because then I can just rewrite the pattern and rip out the sample and re-knit it. Um, uh, All right. We have a first guess for the name. So Barbara Uh guesses, oh my God, I'm going to butcher the name. (laughs) Aethel? Aethelflate? Aethel? Am I, okay. I don't know. <laughs> no, you don't have to say. It. I was like, I, I need All to right, do this. Ben. That was a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Who said that? Who said that? Bar- Barbara. So curious to oh, Barbara. Good um, guess, Barbara. <laughs> very well done. Okay. Um. So. Let's wrap up for today because I've already taken up almost an hour of your time. And I loved our chat. You know, I could talk to you for hours. (laughs) Yeah. So if people want to find more about you, where is the best places for them to go? Um, Well, my website, woollymammothfibercompany.com or Instagram, woollymammothfibers or Ravelry, woollymammothemma. Willie Mama Emma. Love that. Yay. Um, Ooh. <laughs> and I will throw in one more into the mix. I link to all of those um in the sort of down bar below, which is your lovely podcast that oh, I yeah, enjoy very much. Um yeah. Which is lovely where you show what you're currently working on. Often there is glimpses of Rufus, Emma's lovely dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I highly encourage you to check to check out the podcast if you're not if you haven't watched it yet. Um, thank you so much, Emma, for your time. This was absolutely absolutely wonderful, and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day and thank enjoy you. Uh, enjoy knitting that sock tonight. <laughs> hopefully, I will. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's It's been really nice. Thank you for coming on. So, um, everyone, thank you so much for watching. I'll be back here in two weeks. That time, then we'll be chatting, or I'll be chatting, <laughs> to <laughs> Johnny from Garth and Noor, uh, one of our wonderful Yay. yarn partners. And Johnny is an all-around awesome person, and I can't wait for you all to meet him. Until then, stay safe and have a wonderful two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye.